Yeah, as people are still filtering in, um, welcome to First Church. Uh, we're glad that you have joined us. I know there's a whole group of people that have uh, taken this last opportunity to uh, to do some camping up north, and uh, so. Uh, but I'm actually very pleased uh, by the number of us that have gathered here this morning. We're going to join our hearts and we're going to join our voices, and we're going to make sure that God is praised here this morning. Yes. Yes. So uh, we will also encourage one another. We will fellowship together after the service. Uh, so please join us uh, in the fellowship hall in the basement. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and so uh, be encouraged by one another. If you're joining us uh, by live stream, you are also welcome. And uh, we encourage you also to come and join us. Uh, for the Coffee Fellowship uh, in um, First Church. Uh, before we get started, before our call to worship, I'm just going to do uh, uh, Les a favor, uh, because uh, Les, if you see him a little bit later on, you will notice that he's a little banged up, and uh, he took a little tumble off a bike uh, when he was in uh, Whistler, uh, and so um, that's what happened. Uh, in case you're wondering, uh, please do uh, commiserate with him and give him all your best and pray for healing. Uh, but he is, thank God, okay, and uh, he just takes a, a little bit of time to, uh, to heal. So uh, I'm glad uh, that uh, God has spared you worse, less, and uh, I'm glad that you uh, could join us this morning as well. There are many other needs, of course, in the congregation as well, and we will be addressing those during our time of prayer. But I just thought uh, poor Les is trying to ex explain the same thing uh, to 62,000 people, and, and the story gets real old after a while, so I thought I'd do him a favor. All right, may I just ask you now to uh, rise, if you are able uh, to receive uh, God's blessing after the call to worship. And the call to worship uh, comes uh, from Psalm 147. I believe that we may have used that last week as well, but as I read it, I thought, you know what, we could be using this every week. Because this is what it says. It says, praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, how pleasant and fitting to praise Him. That is why we are here, and we are certainly going to do that. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to extend God's blessing to all of us uh, as we enter into worship. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you so that you may live and to put his spirit inside of you so that you may live with joy and with courage. This is the God that greets you this morning. Grace and peace to you from God the Father, his beloved son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people say, Amen. God has greeted you. Let us burst forth in worship.
I know I always uh, go out of my way um, to welcome people in the morning uh, before we receive God's greeting. Um, I try to uh, make this a welcoming place, and, uh, and in doing that, I, I, I try to be upbeat. And, uh, but I know that we all come to church um, with, in different spaces, head spaces and heart spaces, uh, some of us are struggling, some of us uh, are, are worried or anxious uh, about different things in our lives. Uh, some of us may be uh, grieving, some of us may be worried. And, and of course, there are also those of us who are uh, still, despite all that, filled with joy. Uh, there are those who, of us who uh, are looking to um, others to encourage them, I hope, uh, I hope that's one of the things that uh, you do as we gather uh, together. Um, first, church ought to be a place of grace, uh, first of all, uh, a place where we receive God's grace. But it is also a place where uh, we learn that uh, grace received uh, is to be grace uh, passed on. Uh, grace is not something, it's one of those gifts that keeps on giving, to use uh, maybe a, a trite phrase. Uh, we usually refer to it in uh, advertisements uh, referring to diamonds or something, uh, and how trite is that? Uh, but grace truly is uh, the gift that we receive from God, uh, whereby he embraces us, whereby he restores us, uh, whereby he loves us deeply, uh, no matter what our circumstances. And we can receive grace when we are in moments of, of, of ecstasy and great joy, and we, and we still uh, appreciate receiving God's grace. But sometimes uh, we need it deeply uh, because of uh, the things that we are struggling with, maybe... Uh, and, and some of that is as a result of the news that we watch, um, and some of it uh, may be much more personal. I know I've been struck uh, this last week, um, and, I'm, and I'm torn even as I tell this. Uh, I've been struck this last week by all the displaced people. Uh, I was shocked uh, to hear that um, the city in, in White, uh, sorry, uh, Whitehorse, uh, 20,000 people uh, moved out of their homes, uh, and they are ending up in uh, various places being uh, welcomed, I hope, and cared for. Um, then, uh, on top of that, which I didn't uh, really realize as much, 30,000 people uh, in B.C., are displaced uh, from the various places, uh, and, and there's a real uh, um, pressure on uh, aid agencies, on governments, on all those uh, other family members who, who welcome uh, those who are being displaced. And the reason I feel tension is uh, I felt compelled this morning to pray, uh, to, to extend our grace if we believe that God uh, um, answers and hears our prayers, then um, we can certainly pray grace into the lives, even uh, from afar. Uh, but what caused me the tension, uh, let me explain, is that why did it take displaced people in Canada for me to be moved to pray? Because, of course, Displaced people uh, is, a, is a bigger reality in the world than, uh, than we might realize. And there's many places uh, where people are displaced, displaced from their homes uh, by war, uh, by uh, economic uh, just devastation and, and, and poverty, and by just hopelessness and helplessness. And uh, it just made me realize that uh, sometimes we only realize something when it comes closer to home. And it is then that we are moved to prayer. Well, I hope that uh, we can be uh, uh, people that uh, pray grace uh, into uh, people's lives, whether they are part of our community, whether they're part of uh, the greater uh, Canada, or whether they're part of, uh, of the world um, population, all of them 
uh, are God's people. So I, uh, for a moment of grace this morning, it goes, it's a, it's a long winded explanation, uh, but I would like to spend uh, just uh, some extra time this morning in prayer. Uh, we are a people of prayer. We are people that believe that God hears and answers prayer. And uh, I'm going to pray this morning for uh, displaced uh, people. So I hope that you will join me. If I leave a moment of silence, uh, you may feel free to, if you dare, to, to add some prayers out loud. And if you feel uncomfortable doing that, um, um, you shouldn't. We are here a family. Uh, but if you feel uncomfortable doing that, uh, God hears your prayer too, if you uh, should say it silently. So let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, and with those two terms, with those uh, two addresses, we, I, I know we can't exhaust, Father, who you are, but those two um, uh, titles that you carry uh, certainly uh, catch something of who you are. You are Almighty God. You are powerful. You are Creator God. You, you hold all things in your hands. You, 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 you uh, have life and death in your hands. And the devil cannot beat us even uh, should we die uh, in our earthly bodies because you hold the keys to life. You are Almighty God. Awesome in your power, enthroned on high. But... You are also loving Father. And so you, you also take us on your knee. You embrace us in your love. You care for us. You notice us when, when we cry. And sometimes, Father, we do cry. It is not like we Christians have uh, things all together and we never struggle or suffer. We live in a broken world, and we are reminded of that again. We are reminded of that constantly. And for some of us, we, 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 we feel that very personally in, in our brokenness, in our own brokenness. But we have been confronted uh, by it again uh, constantly and repeatedly on uh, the news uh, with displacement. Father, all of us want a sense of belonging, and we're looking for home. When we're on earth, we, 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 we seek a place to call home, a, a place where we're welcomed and recognized and loved. Uh, and you, even at the close of our lives, as we face death, we, we still long for home. And we are assured that you have a home for us. You have prepared a place for us. And now as we watch, Father, uh, things taking place, fires and devastations and, and uh, oddly enough, floods in other places and war, um, we, we are overwhelmed, Father, by the sights and sometimes even uh, the, the smells and the, the sounds of displacement. Everything gets brought into our living rooms. And yet, even then, Father, it can seem like a movie rather than reality because our homes uh, are secure. We feel secure here, and we thank you for, for that. But there are many, Father, who struggle, and many uh, even whose homes are being burned to the ground and uh, who, who, who need to take off and who need to make those difficult choices of what to take and what to leave behind, knowing that they may never see uh, those things left behind again. And even if they do, even if they should return, even if their houses were spared, uh, Father, they return to neighborhoods where there is so much devastation that their house may be the lone one standing. And then what does that do to your sense of security and your sense of home? And so, Father, we pray for the devastation. We pray for the people who... Uh, yeah, who, who are probably at a loss for words and whose uh, who's only thing that comes to mind to do is to, is to cry and to weep and to 
and to say where and how is this all going to work. Father, we ask for helping hands. We ask for agencies and governments, but we ask for individuals. We ask for churches. We ask for grace and mercy to be shown, for, for practical help, for places to sleep and, and things to eat and, and places to put your pets and, and, and park the, 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 the few belongings that you can take with you. We pray for uh, firefighters and, and all the, the people that respond uh, who work, I say tirelessly, but I'm sure it is wearying to the point of, of exhaustion. And so we pray for strength, and we pray for courage, and we pray for perseverance, and we pray for safety. And we pray for, yes, even hope, because um, as I see the walls of fire, uh, I, I can imagine that uh, as you face that, you, you may lose hope. It may seem like a hopeless prospect. Uh, when we stand, Father, beside a fire truck, it seems big. And yet when we see a fire truck uh, um, against this wall of flames, we realize how small that truck is and how big uh, the fires can be and the devastation and, and, the, and the, the, the ruthless power of uh, the destruction of, 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 the, of it all. So we pray, Father, for people that are displaced and that live in fear and are anxious and uh, that, that they may find uh, places and moments of, um, of comfort, of, of hope, um, that they may um, feel, find places of, of, of safety and security. Amen. Um, Father, hear our prayers. Take a moment now to pray, whether uh, silently or out loud, if you wish. Pray for people that you may know um, that are affected. And pray for those you uh, do not know. And now pray beyond Canada into other places. Uh, Ukraine uh, comes to mind most vividly, but uh, I'm sure there are many other places. Uh, forgive me if I forget. Father, as a church, we believe that you are Almighty God and a, a, a heavenly, loving, caring Father. And moreover, we believe that our world belongs to you. So, if there's any way that we can help, Father, use us. Make us attentive to the cries. Help us to share what we have. And may this not be the last time or the only time and the only place that we pray, but that we may continue to that, that, that our prayers may not cease for those who are hurting and those who are suffering. Amen. Father, um, send your spirit out. Uh, send rains. Provide for your creatures in a broken world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's respond to that by singing, I don't know. God be merciful to me.
up. Please join me in congregational prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, a morning where you've brought us together with our family in Christ. Um, also a time where we can recognize that we are just one of many branches of this family, Lord. Um, this branch here in Edmonton, on this street, on this place, but also part of a, a much greater forest of branches, um, all connected in the family, um, in your family. And we thank you for that. We're also so thankful for your undiminishing grace um, and your ongoing forgiveness that we can come here as we are every Sunday, that we can come to you as we are every day and you continue to extend that grace and forgiveness to you, Lord. Um, what a wonderful gift that is that you give to us um, that we are just so thankful for. And we're also thankful for this opportunity to gather as a group here to hear your word this morning. And we ask you, oh, please, bless Pastor Bernard today, that you will work through him, bless the words of his mouth as he shares um, your message with us today. Um, open our ears, open our hearts to hear that word, um, the challenge that it may contain for us, the blessing that it always contains for us. Um, may we be open to that here today. We also come with concerns and laments too, Lord. Um, there are times where our lives are challenging. We've heard already so much about the people who've been displaced and we continue to lift them up. We also ask you all please to help us and others see what it, we are called to do, um, how we can be Christ-like, how we can be the witnesses of you in the lives of people who are undergoing difficulties um, and struggles. Um, and let us recognize that it is more, that we're required to do more than just wish people well. Um, but we need to, to give our coats, to give of the many resources that we actually have to help those people in need, um, and that that is your calling for us. We think, too, of the times of uncertainty and anxiety that many people have, um, and we take comfort in that you are our refuge, that you're our stronghold in times of trouble. Um, a stronghold that's always open to us, um, one that we can go to even when we don't know why things are happening the way that they are. Um, and we thank you for that. We also lift up some very specific concerns of members of this congregation. We think of Ina's father who started his cancer treatments. We ask you, oh, please um, help him to respond well to those, guide the hands and the minds of the medical professionals, and also be with the family um, as these struggles continue. We also think of uh, Bob's neighbor, Brenda, and we just lift her up after the incredibly difficult week that she had um, with her son, Troy, who looked like he might be recovering and then passed away on Saturday. And we just ask that you send your peace to her and to her family. And we also think of the nurse at Bob's location as well, who's asked to be lifted up in prayer. Um, and we bring her and her children um, before you, Lord. Um, and we just ask that you continue to work in your mysterious ways through their hearts, um, that you speak to them, and that they hear your good news um, on their hearts, and also through the witness that Bob can bring to them as well. Amen. And then we also think of Diana, um, and her family and their niece. And we just ask you, please be with them now as they, they go through this difficult time of um, maybe in many ways waiting, Lord, um, for, for the finality of what may be on this earth, um, but with the hope of what comes in the future um, of living in you. And then we also lift up less, um, that you'll lay your healing hands upon him. Um, and... Uh, also are thankful for him as a member of our congregation um, and just the example that he also shows of uh, being out there and enjoying life even if it sometimes comes with some difficult consequences. As we think lastly as well of Nanette, Annette, sorry, um, who has her last couple Sundays here in North America as she prepares to go back to her home in Kenya. Um, thank you for the time that she could spend with us um, for the witness that she is to us too, actually, um, and bless her as she goes back to her home in Kenya and continues her work there um, in Tenwick. 
And then finally, as we look towards the start of another school year, what we often think of as the start of a formal church year as well, um, we just ask you to bless the work of everyone's hands here. Um, speak on people's hearts as we're always in need of volunteers to do the work of your place here. Um, and may we all find um, the place that we can bring our, our gifts and our talents um, to glorify you. Last Lord, looking at the bulletin, we see there's a, there's a lot of upcoming birthdays here in the next week and a half, and we're just so thankful for these people in our lives um, that they've been able to celebrate yet another year on this creation of yours. Um, we ask that you'll continue to bless them, um, that they will also continue to be a blessing for us as they have already been um, as members of your church family, as children of Christ. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our offering this morning is for the CRCNA Day of Justice. I don't see too many children, but there are some uh, today, and uh, we lift God's name on high. Uh, it means something that we are God followers, and sometimes we, 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 tell, we think it, uh, about it as this is, I should pray, and I should read my Bible, and I, I need to be a good person, and I should not tell lies, and I, and, and you, you hear how many times they say, I I, I, I. What uh, the Bible actually uh, has a different picture of what it means to be, uh, uh, to be a Christ follower. To be, to, to be coming to church means not always I, 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 I. It means how can I be helpful to others and to you. And so maybe when we talk about following Jesus and walking with Jesus we should use less I and more you. And that's really what I'm trying to say this morning. As uh, Maybe we should just all go for coffee <laughs> now that you've heard that. Uh, but uh, we will. Uh, Yamaki is already uh, enjoying that here. Uh, um, Yes, but that's really what, what our sermon, my sermon, my message is going to be about. I hope that makes a little bit of sense, and I hope that you can kind of follow along a little bit, little bits and pieces of that.
So uh, this morning's reading, uh, Galatians uh, 6, 1 through 5, and I want to add a, a word of clarification right away. Ideally, I would read all the way from the beginning of chapter 5 uh, through to verse 10 of chapter 6. Now, we're not used to reading like whole chapters in, in church. Maybe we'll get there. And maybe we'll get there if I learn to make my sermon a little shorter, then we can, then we can make the scripture reading a little longer. But that's not happening today. So um, I, I think reading that much would, would make for a long reading. And so this should not stop you from reading. So this afternoon, uh, if it is too cool to sit outside, uh, uh, or even if it isn't, maybe you can take some time aside uh, with a cup of tea uh, and, and do exactly what we're not going to do together, but read all the way back from chapter 5 of Galatians uh, to uh, chapter 6, verse 10, and that gives you a, a, a bigger um, sense of, of our message. It gives us context. Um, the other verses, in a way, provide a foundation uh, for what we are going to look at more specifically. So we read together verses 1 through 5, but realize that they are really only properly understood when you put them back into the chapters that they come from. Um, so I encourage you again to take time to read those at home during a time of devotions, perhaps, or as an extra in your day, uh, remembering what a privilege it is that we can read the Bible freely at any time uh, and anywhere. Amen. And I know we've prayed a lot today uh, already, but we're going to pray one more time for God's guidance uh, before we read. Father, um, put your spirit inside of us. Um, so we need that because... Um, we can't be so arrogant as to think that we can read your Bible all by ourselves. Um, just give us light, Father, and remove any distracting thoughts from us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we read this morning uh, Galatians uh, chapter 6, the verses 1 through 5. You will always see me walking this way because uh, we're, we're looking forward to a bigger screen here at some point, because your pastor is getting old and he can't see well. So what can I say? So I get a little bit closer, and then I can just read it. Otherwise, I have to turn my back to you. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. And each one should uh, um, test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing themselves to someone else. For each should carry their own load. This is the word of God for us this morning. And again, I hope you, you, you feel you, you, the tension in this a little bit. We should carry burdens and we should carry our own load. How, how does that work? Brothers and sisters, starts our reading. If someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should uh, but let me stop there or at least pause to ask just who those people are the spiritual i mean because when paul says you who are spiritual he is obviously making a distinction uh, distinguishing the spiritual from those who are not spiritual. Now, it is popular to think about spirituality as a lone quest 
Finding one's self is other language that is popular, that is often used, uh, that is commonly used. And when I typed the phrase, uh, the spiritual, into my Google search bar, yes, pastors do that too, it showed me pictures like the ones I included in the PowerPoint. Lone figures contemplating life and meaning and purpose in picturesque places of isolation. Places, take note, with perfect sunsets and no one else around to break the peace, the quiet, and the silence that seemed to go with the quest of the spiritually minded. I was talking to uh, Gladys this morning, and I was commiserating with her crazy household. Sorry, I'm not blaming anybody for the craziness, but... And, and I asked her, wouldn't it be nice, like, if you just had that kind of space, just to be spiritual? But oftentimes, our lives don't work that way. Our lives are like <laughs> crazy busy. And, and so th these pictures that we have of spiritual people uh, alone on a mountain, uh, enjoying peace and quiet, uh, Gladys says, oh, I, <laughs> how I wish. I don't think Gladys is the only one who, who, who has that sense. Those places are beautiful, they're idyllic, they're desirable even, and sometimes we do have times where we, we, we might be able to find such places, but this is not the picture that the Bible presents of the spiritual. The first words in our verse should give us a clue. Brothers and sisters... Notice that Paul is addressing not one on a mountain, but many. And then, and then the phrase itself, you who are spiritual. And now it is time for a grammar lesson. How many of you were paying attention in English class? The you here is a nominative personal plural pronoun. How does that grab you? Probably not at all, but it is important. Uh, nominative, meaning that you is the subject of the sentence. It is not the person caught in sin, which is usually where the focus goes right away. No, God is addressing you. It is also personal, meaning that you, you are being addressed personally, each one of you, as if God is sitting across from you eye to eye. But then, it is also plural, meaning that Paul and God is, isn't just talking to one person sitting on a mountain, but he is talking to many people. He's talking to a group. See, the, the tricky part in English is when you say you, you don't know if I'm talking about you, one, stu, you, stu, or if I'm talking about you, all of you, besides Stu. I'm telling you this morning that the you here is plural. So in the Bible's understanding, you who are spiritual is a group thing. I've said it before and I'll keep saying it, there is no such thing as a lone Christian. I know people get fed up by church and they walk away and they say, well, 
I will serve God by myself. No. Faith is a together thing. And as much as it may be tempting to go off by yourself when you're frustrated or fed up with the challenges of being church together, to be spiritual on top of the mountain or in nature where, where you don't have to deal with any difficult and disappointing people, that is not biblical. Look back to chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves, plural, be burdened again by a yoke of other people. Just leave the other people behind. Forget about them. No, don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The freedom of Christ is set in the context of others. And then skip over to chapter 5, verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit... And you, plural, will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Life in the Spirit, too, is lived with others. And if you look at the fruits of the Spirit, listed in verses 22 and 23 you will notice that all those fruits really only make sense in relationship to others. Goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, uh, right? All of those things you, you, you need to, to relate to other people. Faith is lived and practiced in community, and the things you need to live that well are things that, you, uh, that allow you to live well with others. The, the point is, and I'm driving it home, I know, when the Bible speaks of being spiritual, it assumes God followers gathered together. So the question of who are the spiritual also answers the question in a way, where are the spiritual? Well, they are in community. Together. It's about gathering together and belonging. That's how you live out your faith. Are you with me? Or do I need to go over this again? Okay, so back to some more grammar. Verbs are action words, and they are often the key to understanding what the Bible says. Notice that there are two main verbs in our text, two main action words. Galatians 6, 1 through 5. It starts with brothers and sisters, so it's addressing all of us. Now, the, the, the action words, the two main verbs, are easier to see if you just write out. And sometimes we need to do this. Sometimes we have these blocks of text in the Bible, and you lose sight of what it is saying. Sometimes what I do is I just rewrite it in, in other blocks that helps me kind of to see what's going on. And so uh, I write it out uh, uh, this way. Uh, the first main verb, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore that person gently. And then the second main verb is in that second block. A and carry, that's the second main verb, each other's burdens now, some of you are going to point out that there are more verbs in the text, and yes, you are right about that, but there are two main verbs, and all the other verbs kind of 
are, are sides. They kind of help to, to explain what it is you're supposed to be mainly doing. Now you, you realize how much you hated grammar, didn't you? <laughs> there are two actions that are tied to God's expectations for those who are spiritual. Those who have found freedom in Christ, those who are instructed to live by the Spirit of God. The main thing Paul is telling them is restore and carry others. Your life is now lived as a community of believers, and your concern, like that of Christ, is for others. To serve others. And as you are doing that, make sure you also watch yourself and test your own actions and motives so that you don't go off the rails in the process. That you don't lose sight of your own spiritual life both your own spiritual growth and your own spiritual failings. Because you see, the spiritual grow. How does growth happen? Well, oftentimes, growth happens by helping others. And many of us are intimidated. We don't want to take on eldership or being involved in youth or, or, or teaching little children because you're just uncomfortable with that. Because you're confronted sometimes by how little you know or, or, or by difficult questions or, 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 or you, you don't want to step outside your box. The box, the couch you're sitting on is quite comfortable. Thank you very much. And you will find that when, when you lead a Bible study or, or when you host a small group or when you uh, spend more time with youth and when you allow yourself to be sucked into being an elder or a deacon, Please misunderstand, don't misunderstand me. I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish those roles. In fact, I'm trying to lift those roles up. But, but they're not easy. I, I realize that. But when you step into that, believing that God will give you what you need in order to do what he wants from you, you will grow. You can ask, you can ask any elder, any deacon. I haven't set them up. But you can be sure that there's growth there when you step into those roles. The spiritual grow by helping others, serving others like Jesus did. And that's, that's the big part of the phrase, like Jesus did. I have not come to be served. Oh, you don't know that verse. But to serve, yes, thank you. I forgot. And in so doing, you will become more like Jesus. Remember that this is your calling in life, God's predestined will for your life. If you were with us last week, and if you weren't, go back to YouTube and, and, and listen to that sermon as well. This is your calling in life, to be more like Jesus. And our text gives us two specific ways to do this. Brothers and sisters, first way, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore that person. You big dummy, why did you do that? No, it says restore that person. Gently, thank you. And this tells us two things. Gently. It tells us two things. First of all, sin happens, even in the church. If you are under the impression, and I'd be surprised if you were, but if you are under the impression that the church is filled with perfect people, anybody here under that illusion?
Sin happens even in the church. People in church are not perfect. They are on a journey on the road to becoming obedient, serving members of Christ's body. You and I, we need help because we will fall along the way. And when we do, we need others to come alongside to restore us, not to judge us, not to shame us, not to condemn us, but to restore us to belonging. We are the body of Christ. We are sinful people on a journey. And when you see someone stumble, reach out to them. Love them back into church. Into, into, into obedience. Into passion. And then two, it tells us this, temptation happens. It tells us that we should watch ourselves too because temptation is never too far away. The gentleness you show to others is something you may need from others in the near future. Don't be too arrogant in your faith. You too are merely human. Yes, you. You too will need the gentle embracing restoration of others along the way. We want to be that kind of community. Pedro wants to be that kind of community. Do all of us want to be that kind of community? The second way to be spiritual, spiritually mature in the faith, is to carry each other's burdens. In this way, says the Bible, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And what is that law of Christ? How did Christ summarize the law and the prophets? Love God and love God. Your neighbor. How do, you, how do you do that? You carry each other's burdens. How often does someone feel alone, abandoned, or forgotten in our churches? Does it happen in our church? First church? Do, do you know? Do you notice? Do you act on it when you see it, or are you too involved with your own group and your own friends? It's a good thing Sean said. He, he, he said, Lord, help us when, when the pastor pushes us. I know I'm pushing. I'm trying to understand the text. You see, we may be happy that we have found our way and that we are doing well, feeling connected, and find joy in coming to church, but that is not the litmus test of a good church. The litmus test of a good church, a spiritually mature church, is how well we carry each other. How well everyone is carried along. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves, says Paul in verse 3. Test yourself in this, Paul adds. Notice also in verse 5 that we should try to carry our own load. As we grow in our faith, we will grow stronger and we will be able to carry more. That is the expectation. As we grow in Christ, we will learn to walk 
more confidently with him and to find our confidence and trust in him, even when things are tough. But when we can't, when we fail, or when life is too much, or when we lose sight of God, and when we fall into temptation and sin, then we are to be carried by the others in our church community. So if you are not among the ones now that are struggling and failing and stumbling, and, 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 and then you should be in the other group, which is the group that is helping to carry others. So you have two choices. You can admit, I'm just losing it. I can't bear this alone. Or you can say, I'm ready to help. I don't care which one you, you, you claim, and maybe you will claim a bit of both. Are you with me? Nobody's with me. So we are to see not just our friends, but we are to see the ones who are struggling, who may feel alone or ashamed or overwhelmed. One of the things that distinguishes Jesus from others is his ability to see people, to notice them, and then to truly see them, and then to address their need, a need that often goes beyond and deeper than what is immediately obvious. It is, it is that ability to see, I believe, that lies behind the verses we read in Galatians 6. The call to restore the other and to carry the burdens of another is deeply rooted in our call to spiritual lives and deeply rooted in our call to be a caring church community. Yes, each one of us called to a personal relationship to Jesus, the way of return to the Holy Creator God who gives us life. And each one of us is on a journey of growth, learning to carry more purposefully the tasks that God assigns to each of us. But the only way for each of us to achieve our purpose, our purpose of growing into the likeness of Jesus, is for each of us, to give ourselves to the good of others. And the two main verbs in our text speak to the what we are to be about and how we are to go about it. And that brings us finally to the why. Why bother? Why the bother of church? Why hard? and sometimes frustrating and wearying tasks of being and building community. And for that, we need to once again step outside of our text, outside of the five verses that spell out our responsibility to each other, and into God's bigger purpose and his bigger plan. God's bigger purpose and his bigger plan is this, Galatians 5 verse 1, freedom in Christ. This can be ours. Galatians 5.16, life by the Spirit. As we grow and develop the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, it is freedom and fruit that we exercise in the community of believers. The church is a place, a commitment to love each other as Christ loved us, restoring those who fall and falter, and carrying those who lack the strength or the maturity to walk their journey of faith rightly. This is the picture of church that the verses of Galatians 6 paints. A community of people committed to each other and supporting one another until, in the words of Ephesians 4 verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of Christ. 
Now, if I were to stop here, we would be amiss. You would miss the final end to which all of this leads. Why all this emphasis on church? Why spend so much time and energy on caring for each other when there's a whole world of hurt out there, outside our doors? Why does so much of our church budgets get spent on ourselves, on our own programs, and on our own people? Have you ever asked that? Isn't there something terribly selfish and insular about this picture of church? Perhaps if we stop reading at verse 5. But then there is verse 10 of the book of Galatians chapter 6. Therefore, Paul ends his letter to the church at Galatia, as we have opportunity... Let us do good to all people. Especially those who belong to the family of believers. Now, why should he say that? Well, the point is, to care, the care that we are called to for each other in the church, the call to see people as Jesus saw them, with the, with, with the attending uh, commitment to restore gently those among us who sin and carry those who have burdens, to laugh with those who are thriving and then to cry with those who are struggling, that call is strongly connected to our sense of mission. When we do that for each other, we are strengthened in our ability and desire to do that for others. I, I, I always run into people in pastoral ministry who say, hmm, shouldn't the church be about out there helping people? And I always ask them that, how are you doing that in the church? We seem to be failing miserably to care for each other. And you want to take on an even bigger job of going out there to care for other people. How well do you think that's going to go? If you can't love the person sitting next to you in church, how well do you think you're going to do loving people out there? How's that for pushing? I think there's method in, in, in God's strategy that we should be a caring, loving community and we should serve one another and love one another. If we can't do that well, maybe we should think twice. <laughs> now, that shouldn't stop us from loving each other well. We should love each other so well that all of us are going to be like excited about going out there to love other people the way you were loved by these people. I better stop. I was taught in Nigeria, and, and the services were three hours long, and I preached for an hour. I better stop. People of First Church, are you loving each other well? Are you doing all that you can to see others, to include others, to go out of your way to reach out to those you don't know. If you can't do this in church, how will you do it to those outside of church? First church, love like Jesus did. Restore gently those who falter. Carry the messy lives of others. Be good to each other and look for opportunities to be good for all. This is what it means to be spiritual. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we, we get it wrong so often. We think church is all about ourselves. Forgive us for our arrogance and forgive us for our ignorance. And help us to be more like Jesus. Amen, Amen indeed. Let us sing praises to him. Stand up, uh, you probably, those of you with sore backs, are probably thinking, oh, I better get up. Let's sing. And I have no idea what the 
thing was anymore. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. When you go out there today, this week, wherever you go, Christ will be with you. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Many of us will not get a chance to do that, to baptize, but we will be able to go out there and tell them, tell people and love them. And this is Christ's promise, and lo, I am with you always, to the very end of the age, and certainly to the very end of your lives whenever that may be. Go with God. Amen. Amen.